Hello and welcome back. In today's session, we are diving into 15 powerful AWS Cloud Engineer interview questions, all explained through real world scenarios, the exact kind of questions companies are asking right now. If you are preparing for roles like AWS Cloud Engineer, DevOps Engineer, Solutions Architect, or Cloud Support Engineer, this session will give you clear, structured, and practical answers that help you stand out in your interviews. We are not just talking about theory. We are breaking down VPC issues, S3 performance, EC2 troubleshooting, scaling architectures, IAM permissions, Lambda problems, and cost optimization. All the challenges you will actually face in your job. So grab a notebook because these insights will help you crack your next AWS interview with confidence. Let's get started. The first question I have is, your company wants to deploy a web application that must be highly available across multiple availability zones. How will you design the architecture? So for this, we can begin by creating a VPC with multiple public and private subnets across at least two availability zones. So like having uh, uh, two public subnets and two private subnets, the application servers would run on the EC2 instances, which are running in the private subnets for security. Traffic would enter through an application load balancer, which is hosted in the public subnet. And for availability, for high availability, we can configure an auto scaling group that uh, spans both availability zone. And this will ensure that your application continues running even if one availability zone fails. Uh, if there are any static files, we can store them in an S3 bucket and uh, session caching can be done using Elastic Cache Redis. And for the database layer, it can be handled by using RDS multi-AZ deployment to ensure disaster recovery. Finally, we can use CloudWatch for monitoring and AWS Systems Manager for patching. The next question we have is your EC2 instance in a private subnet cannot reach the internet for updates. What will you check? So for the first thing that we will need to check is whether the private subnet is correctly associated with the route table that points to the NAT gateway in a public subnet. Next, we can verify the NAT gateway's public subnet, whether it has a route to the internet gateway. We can also check the security groups and NACLs to ensure that uh, they are allowing HTTP and HTTPS traffic. If using custom DNS, then we can check the VPC DNS settings, like whether it is enabled or not. Most commonly, the issue is either missing a NAT route or wrong subnet association or your NACL is blocking the traffic. Next question we have is your application is facing high latency reading files from S3, what can be done? So for this, we will need to first enable S3 transfer acceleration if the users are global. So basically transferring the data across the globe. And if the latency is between S3 and EC2 within the same region, then we can check for the use of S3 VPC endpoints, which provides faster and direct routing. For frequently accessed objects, we can set up CloudFront as a caching layer. And we can also enable S3 intelligent tiering so that if there are any infrequent objects, they will stay cheap, but frequently accessed objects remain uh, performant. The next question we have is a developer cannot access an S3 bucket even though you attach the correct policy. What's the next step? So for this, we can start by checking the IAM policy itself. So check if there are any deny statements in the policy because explicit denies will override everything. Then check if there are any S3 bucket policies since bucket policies can also block the access. Next, we can check for the IAM role versus IAM user confusion. So we will need to ensure we are using the correct identity like the IAM role or the IAM user. Then verify the session policies. If there are any uh, you know, temporary credentials, which can sometimes override the permissions. And then finally check your MFA conditions. Some policies will require MFA to be used. Most commonly it will be your uh, bucket policies, which are overriding your IAM user permissions. The next question we have is your EC2 instance suddenly restarted. What would you check? So for this, we can check the cloud trial for the stop or terminate actions often done by the auto scaling group or user initiated. Then we can check the CloudWatch logs for any uh, hardware failure indications like basically your system uh, uh, logs of your EC2 instances. And if the instance is a spot instance, then interruptions can occur, which is expected. 
We can also verify the scaling policies and health checks that might have replaced the instances. Finally, we can check the scheduled maintenance from AWS. Like if it's a very old instance, then AWS will plan for maintenance, like terminate the instance or upgrading and all those things. So we can check the maintenance window as well. The next question we have is your RDS instance is hitting high CPU usage. How do you scale? So we can start by checking if there are any slow queries, which is um, um, uh, causing the issue. And for this, we can use the performance insights. If the queries are optimized, then we can scale vertically by changing the instance class to a larger one, basically changing the instance type. If it's a read heavy database, then we can consider adding read replicas. And for high availability, we can ensure that multi AZ is enabled. And if the consistent spike continues, we can uh, consider using Amazon Aurora for better automatic scaling. The next question you have is you need to migrate 10 TB of data from on premises to AWS. What will you use? So for this, there are multiple options that are available uh, whenever you talk about transferring the data from on-prem to AWS. One option is um, uh, using AWS Snowball Edge. This is if the internet bandwidth is limited, we can use this, which allows offline transfer of your data. But if the bandwidth is good, we can consider using uh, AWS Data Sync, which is for faster incremental transfers. For databases, we can use this service called uh, DMS, uh, which gives you zero downtime cutover. So we can use this to migrate from one database to another database. The next question we have is your Lambda function keeps timing out. What will you do? So for this, we can first check the CloudWatch logs to identify if there are any bottlenecks. If it's a cold start issue, then we can enable provisioned concurrency. And if it's uh, external API delays, then we can add retries with exponential backoffs. And if the function is performing heavy processing, then we can consider increasing the memory, which will also increase the CPU. Finally, we can increase the overall timeout itself if necessary. Like, you know, you have maximum of 15 minutes, we can consider increasing the timeout as well. The next question we have is your API gateway returns 500 errors occasionally. How do you debug this? So for this, we can enable X-ray tracing for end-to-end -end visibility. Then we can also check the cloud uh, Lambda logs for any exceptions. We can inspect the API gateway integration settings to ensure the templates are correctly mapped. And then if the issue is related to payload size, then we can validate the limits. Like, you know, what is the limit you have set? Often, these errors come from unhandled Lambda exceptions. Within the code itself, you're not handling the exceptions. It could be because of that. The next question we have is here, you have an S3 bucket that must be made accessible only to internal applications. How can you do this? So the first thing that we will need to do is disable the public access on the S3 bucket. Then we can attach an S3 VPC endpoint policy that allows uh, access only from the VPC to the required S3 bucket. We can then update the bucket policy to allow only from the VPC endpoints principle. And this will ensure that you're only allowing private and secure access to the S3 bucket only from your internal applications. The next question we have, you have a DynamoDB table that has fluctuating latency. What is the solution for this? So for this, first we can start by enabling auto scaling of your uh, read capacity units and write capacity units. And if it's a hot partition, we can redesign the partition keys itself. If the queries are very inefficient, then we can consider adding global um, secondary index or local secondary index. Finally, we can enable DAX uh, for caching if the read latency is the issue. The next question we have is you observe that your monthly bill increased suddenly. How can you track and reduce the cost? So for this, we can begin by checking the cost explorer service and the AWS budgets service. Using this, we can identify any unused resources like uh, ideal EC2 instances or orphaned EBS volumes or underutilized RDS instances. We can also consider using savings plans for EC2 and Lambda and S3 lifecycle rules for storage. Finally, we can enable tagging for visibility. So um, if you enable tagging, it will be easier for us to view the reports on Cost Explorer and AWS budgets. The next question we have is you observe that your application suddenly becomes unreachable. 
how will you troubleshoot this? So for this, we can begin by checking the route 53 health checks. So basically start the troubleshooting at the DNS level first. If there are no issues, then we can check the load balancer metrics and the target um, uh, groups within your load balancer. We can also check EC2 instance health status, you know, the overall health status of your instances. Then we can verify security groups and NACLs for any accidental blocks that might be happening. Check if there are any database connectivity issues that might be impacting your application. So maybe your application is not able to connect to the database. Finally, we can review the deployment logs to see if there was any recent change that happened. If yes, then we can consider rolling back to the stable version to fix the issue. The next question we have is you have configured CloudWatch alarms to monitor some metrics, but you notice that they don't trigger notifications. How will you troubleshoot this? So for this, we can begin by checking if the metric itself exists or not. Then we can check if there is a, a wrong threshold that is set. If that is the case, then you may also see the alarm in the insufficient data uh, state. And uh, we'll also need to verify whether the SNS topic has a permission or if the subscription is missing. So you will need to have you need to set the necessary permissions. Check if the IM policies for SNS are set and you are allowing the necessary permissions. Finally. Check your CloudWatch for any delivery failure logs and understand why that is happening. The next question we have is your application must survive a complete region outage. How do you design this? So for this, we can design an active-passive setup or an active-active multi-region setup. So for app servers, we can use Route 53 latency routing. For uh, stateless, we can use uh, we can replicate the data using the s3 cross region replication for databases we can make use of aurora a global database or dynamodb global tables we can then ensure to have the ci cd deployed in both the regions and then we can enable route 53 health checks failover failover automatically to automatically failover if one region goes down and that brings us to the end of the uh, session I hope this 15 real world questions and scenario based explanations gave you the clarity and confidence to tackle your next cloud role. If you found this session helpful, please hit that like button, uh, subscribe to the channel for more content and let me know in the comment section if you have any queries. If you want videos on specific topics like AWS VPC deep dive, hands on EC2 demos, CICD pipelines or Kubernetes interview questions, just drop your request in the comments. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next session.